name is Brenna Bell. I use she and her pronouns, and I am talking to you from the land of the Tualatin Kalapuya and the Clackamas Chinook, um, which is commonly referred to as Southwest Portland or the Tryon Creek watershed in our modern settler colonial names. I'm really glad that you're here with us for this third portion of our National Forests on Stolen Lands webinar. This has been uh, quite a journey um, with many of you, quite a journey for Courtney and I to pull together to research and share this information with you. And we're glad that you are here with us tonight. We're going to start like we do in all our BARC events, if my computer will move, move forward. Here we go. Um, just introducing BARC as an organization. I'm sure many of you are familiar with us. Here's our mission working to transform Mount Hood National Forest into a place where natural processes prevail, where wildlife thrives, and where local communities have a social, cultural, and economic investment in its restoration and preservation. And then also working on our historical accountability and land acknowledgement. I'm going to read this and you're invited to read quietly along with me. As an organization founded by white people in the lineage of settler colonial environmentalism, Bark understands that conservation work is embedded in the white supremacist legacy of colonization. Land theft, cultural erasure, genocide, and the systemic use of law to suppress native sovereignty over their homelands. We understand that Bark's dedication to protecting these stolen lands, referred now as the public lands of Mount Hood National Forest, carries with it this paradox, which continues to be ignored by most conservation groups and which continues to harm indigenous people today. In our advocacy and policy work, Bark's interactions with federal agencies often comply with the authority assumed by the US federal government. This authority was assumed through the legalized displacement and genocide of indigenous people and cultures, including through the legislative creation of public lands. These crimes and injustices have not been reconciled nor rectified. Today, all non-native people have the privilege of primary access to these public lands as a direct result of this strategy of legalized supremacy. Bark recognizes that conservation organizations like ours are often complicit in the ongoing displacement of native people and culture each time settlers and other non-Indigenous people claim the benefits of access to this land without acknowledging this context and by engaging in the paradox of protecting stolen lands. We are working to change the vision, mission, and strategies of our organization. Bark affirms that these are the rightful homelands of the Multnomah, Malala, Kalapuya, Chinook, Clackamas, Tenaino, Wasco, Wishram, Paiute, and the many other Native people who live here and who have always lived here, who have always belonged to and cared for this land, and whose bold resistance to colonial oppression should guide us all. Bark is committing to the work necessary to repair relationships between settler descendants and Indigenous people, and between all non-Indigenous people and the land. Acknowledgement is just the first necessary step in this revolutionary cultural work. We ask our community to practice humility, respect, and apology with us by personally dedicating your time, energy, and action, and resources to support the people who rightfully belong to this land. Now, if you have practiced acknowledgement with Bark before, please get the notebook that you use for this practice. And if this is your first practice, please get yourself something to write with. Take the next two to three minutes to offer some instructions, intentions, actions, next steps for yourself, outlining how you'll develop your practice of acknowledgement through action. If you have been at a recent BARC event, you should have your writings from past events. Please revisit what you've set out yourself to do. How have you made your intentions concrete? Take this time to reflect on your efforts and update your intention and action plan. So now two to three minutes, of quiet writing.
All right, let's wrap that up. All right, thanks everyone for being with us tonight. And um, now in, in some ways, this entire webinar series is a land acknowledgement. In some ways, this entire series is meant to go deeper in what does it mean to advocate for and enjoy these public lands that are stolen lands. And if you've been with us since the beginning, um, we've taken you on a trip through the doctrine of discovery, manifest destiny, treaty making, um, the Transcendentalist Movement, the uh, Allotment Act, the Wilderness Act. We've had a long thought about how do these theories and practices that moved settler colonialism uh, onto the land also have moved our conservation movement uh, with it. So today, at least in my part, I'm backing off a little bit from the philosophy. Um, we're going to get more into the law and policy around land. The third part, we started with the treaty making period um, from about 1840 to 1870. And now I'm going to just do a little review moving forward. Oh, here's, here's my title. This is what we're going to do. Reorganization, termination, restoration, and land back. But we're going to start back with the Dawes Act. Um, if you'll remember this from the last section, or it might be review, or it might be new to some of you, this is, uh, it was the second major land grab after the treaty making period. And the majority of tribes had been forced onto reservations. Their land had been whittled down to these small areas. Um, the Dawes Act came and broke those areas up. Right. It was a way to get rid of collective ownership of land and it divided the land. As you can see, each head of family received a grant of 160 acres. Um, a single person would get a grant of 80 acres. And so rather than holding the land traditionally in common, they were moving in this assimilation mode to holding it individually in fee simple. Um, and that was disastrous for Native people in this country. You know, here's a, a, a brief, you know, look at why is because most of that land moved out of Native hands. Because if the reservation was so large that um, there was surplus land after it had been allotted to all the individuals, the US, United States government then took that surplus land and sold it off to settlers, Indian land for sale. Um, and in that way, they lost about the tribes that had already remember had a super shrunk land base, lost about 90 million additional acres of land from within their reservation boundaries. So it was the second wave of massive land redistribution out of native hands and into the hands of either the federal government or white settlers. So I just wanted to, to refresh our memory about the Dawes Act because that is setting the stage for the next period of uh, federal land policy as it relates to tribes. And that is called, whoops, sorry, the, the period of the Indian Reorganization Act. And I've got to go back a little bit to how we got there. So one thing that happened in the United States was World War I. That's where it's kind of starting in the World War I period. And a lot of indigenous people fought in World War I. And the country was impressed. I mean, uh, if you wonder, look at it, like there's a lot of reasons why um, tribes might not want to fight on behalf of the US government, but they did. And they were extremely successful and got highly decorated. And the US government for the first time stopped and thought, what's the status of the tribes in the country? And in 1924, Congress authorized a survey on the state of life in the reservations after the implementation of the Dawes Act. It was called the Merriam Report based on the, the last name of the man who was the key author of it. And it was the first general study of Indian conditions across the country since 1850. It combined narrative with statistics and ended up with an extremely scathing report 
on the way that the Department of Interior and the Bureau of Indian Affairs had been handling things, and especially the impact of the Dawes Act on breaking up tribal homes, tribal culture, and tribal land. Um, the report found that the federal government was failing at protecting Native Americans, their land, their resources, both personal and cultural. And uh, I give a little air quotes to protecting. That is the, the language that they used. And I think it's important to note that this is still very much embedded in that paternalistic approach of these times, the idea of the federal trust that the tribes were supposed to be held and protected by the US government which is a, you know, a shift from the beginning of the treaty making period where they were really seen as sovereign to sovereign and interacted as such. By now, the federal government has so much more power that they are supposed to protect the tribes and hold their resources and trust. But they were breaking that trust, violating it. Um, and so the Merriam report really spurred action for reform, which eventually led to the passage of this Indian Re Reorganization Act, which was also called the Wheeler Howard Act. Sorry, the Wheeler Howard Act. I need a quick drink. <clears throat> and it was the centerpiece of what was called the Indian New Deal. So this is President Roosevelt, not the one we talked about last time. This is FDR. And the stated goal of the Indian Re Reorganization Act was to reverse the US goal of cultural assimilation of Native Americans and to encourage, strengthen, and perpetuate tribes and their historic Native American cultures in the United States. The IRA was championed by John Collier, who was the head of the Bureau of Indian Affairs at that time, who had long been advocating for more tribal sovereignty and self-determination. And he tried to get more radical language into the Indian Reorganization Act um, who's really pushing for more decision making and less government control over the tribes. But this was a bit too radical, especially for people who are really benefiting from land seizure and land theft. So Congress didn't go all the way back towards full tribal sovereignty. Um, and they kept management under the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the Department of the Interior. But because of the Dawes Act, right, two thirds of the land in the reservations had been moved out of reservation hands. So one of the main things that the Indian Reorganization Act did was provide mechanisms for moving that land back into tribal trust land. And it did it in uh, several ways. One, it just stopped the process of allotting land to individual people. One of the things that they had found was that once people had their land and owned it in fee simple, they were unable to pay the taxes on it because they didn't really exist in the market economy the same way a lot of other settlers did. And so they just didn't have the money to pay the taxes that came along with the land. And they lost it. The government seized the land that they had been allotted and then sold it out. So one of the things the Indian Reorganization Act did was provide mechanisms to buy that land back and provide a, a revolving fund so that tribes would actually have the money to bring the land back. And this, you know, some of these things I think were, were done with really good intention and, um, and actually had some impact. But under the entire Reorgan Indian Reorganization Act in the first 20 years, tribes reclaimed about 2 million acres of their land. But I want to hold that in the context of they lost 90 million acres in the Allotment Act. So while there was a move to shift the land and the land ownership, and there was a move to take that land that was still surplus and didn't get allotted and move it back into tribal control and out of the federal government control, overall, it was a small drop in the bucket. Another thing, though, that the Indian Reorganization Act did um, was to encourage, because it was encouraging self-governance, was to encourage tribes and bands to adopt their own written constitutions and set up tribal governments. And this has very mixed reviews, right? Courtney will, is going to talk a little bit more about this when we get into it. In one way, from, this, uh, from John Collier's perspective of really wanting to encourage self-governance, um, we can think that that makes sense. But in another way, it was the imposition of a very Western approach to government that has um, led to a lot of dissension, e even now with the tribes. So I feel like 
with, you know, with the Indian Reorganization Act, there were good intentions, but still t firmly based in a, a history of so much destruction that even good intentions couldn't correct that. But, and still within that very paternalistic mode where the government was supposed to take care of the tribes and um, tell them how to do the self-governance, which is, is not what sovereignty is about. Um, however, the IRA still is the basis for most uh, Indian policy now. And when Courtney gets to the 60s and 70s, what happened there, this was the basis that set that up. It was a huge shift from the assimilation policies of the Dawes Act. And for a little bit of time, um, it looked like things might be going in a slightly better direction. Not great, <laughs> but given how challenging it had been in terms of land and being able to hold on to indigenous land slightly better. And kind of in that realm of slightly better times was also the Indian Claims Commission Act. So, you know, the major topic I've covered is the way that indigenous land moved out of indigenous hands and into either federal government or private lands. And, um, and a lot of the pain and the harm and the fraud and the lies that were associated with that. And so the Indian Claims Commission Act was created because, well, I'll back up a little bit. Before there was this act, if tribes wanted to make bring a claim against the United States government for either um, money damages for a Fifth Amendment taking clause, basically saying that the US government took our property without due process of law, uh, which they did a lot. <laughs> if before the tribe could bring that claim, there had to be what was called a special jurisdictional act by Congress waiving sovereign immunity for the United States government and basically agreeing that the tribe could bring that claim for every single claim. They had to make a special jurisdictional act. And then by 1946, nearly 200 claims had been filed, each one needing its separate jurisdictional act, but only 29 had actually resolved because the Court of Claims had dismissed all of the other ones on technicalities or procedural claims, which meant that they had to go back, get a new special jurisdictional act to correct their claims and sue again. And the process just wasn't working. I mean, it was clogging up the system and it was taking forever. And these are people who have already lost so much and don't have an enormous amount of time or energy or money to put into legal battles. And so the United States government passed the Indian Claims Commission Act, which created um, this uh, commission basically to be the major arbiter between the United States government and tribes. And it created broad sweeping um, immunity, sovereign immunity, so that tribes could bring these claims without having to every single time get permission from the federal government to do it. It also expanded the claims that they could have. So beyond just those Fifth Amendment takings claims, they could bring a claim for unconscionable consideration, just basically means the government's payment of money was significantly below the fair market value of the land at the time that it was ceded or a breach of fair and honorable dealings that were not necessarily a part of an existing rule of law or equity. Um, I think of this as like the government were real big jerks clause. And so there, there was this commission, it was created, there was sovereign immunity was waived and they were able to move things, but there was this big hitch, as it says in the slide, the commission could not return land. It could only pay money. That's it, right? These, these claims were all about land and the tribes wanted their land back. The commission could only pay them the fair market value of the land at the time that it was taken or ceded. And then adding to that paternalist approach, that money didn't actually go to the tribes. The US government paid money to itself and then it stayed in being held by trust in the US government. And there are ample stories I found about tribes just having a hell of a time getting their trust fund money dispersed from the government. So there were still, it's like, right, we're in this phase of better, but it's still really bad. It's only better compared to a baseline of genocide, right? 
So we're, we're in this space. I kind of think of this as like the one step forward, three quarters of a step back with both the Indian Reorganization Act and the Indian Claims Commission Act. Because while some land was restored under the IRA, it wasn't much. And no land could be restored under the Indian Claims Commission Act. Um, tribes were able to use some of the money that they got to try and acquire private lands that were inside their own reservations and bring them back. The irony of that is great. Um, but it was still a system that really did not put land back anywhere near the, um, the center of the policy. So let's see, what do we have next? Oh, we have red trevals. <laughs> I was getting kind of depressed on this by the time I got to this part. And I, I realized we're starting out you know, we're not, we didn't even start out heavy, but we're about to get really heavy. So I put in the cutest animal I could think of. These are red tree bulls. Bark likes to protect the trees that they live in. Um, but now we're getting to where it gets a lot darker, which is the return to assimilation as the major federal policy for tribes. This is in the 1950s. And Congress adopted an official policy of uh, tribal termination declaring that their goal is to, quote, as rapidly as possible, make Indians within the territorial limits of the United States subject to the same laws and entitled to the same privileges and responsibilities as are applicable to other citizens of the US. So there were three major components to this policy. Relocation, reduction of federal jurisdiction, um, which had a corollary of increased state jurisdiction and tribal termination. So we're going to spend the bulk of our time on tribal termination, but I think it's important to know that these three um, were packaged all together and all of them were really focused on breaking up uh, indigenous people as sovereign people, as nations, as a people and just dispersing them across the landscape without land, without cultural identity, aside from being US citizens subject to the same rights and responsibilities as all others. So the first major one is relocation. And the Indian Relocation Act of 1956, also known as the Adult Vocational Training Program, uh, in it, the Bureau of Indian Affairs encouraged American Indians to leave reservations and their traditional lands and to assimilate into the general population in urban areas and often worked to do vocational training or place these workers in seasonal jobs such as agriculture and railroads. And the, the relocation sites were primarily cities. There were four cities in California, Los Angeles, San Francisco, San Jose and Oakland. Major other hubs were Denver, Chicago, Cleveland, Dallas, Detroit, and thousands of people were moved off of reservations to these cities in an effort to force assimilation. As you can imagine, adjustment to urban living was very challenging, and many people did not make it through the vocational programs, and if they still had a reservation to return to, they did. Um, however, there was a this was a major shift into creating a diverse pan-Indian urban environment. In Portland, we see the fruits of these projects. There are 380 different tribes represented in the Portland urban area. And in some ways that has been a real boon to have this mixed um, pan-Indian movement in these urban centers. But the reason why is because people were you know, in, in this moment, not forcibly relocated, definitely coerced in, in multiple ways, but it's again, continuing that process that was started with colonization, with treaty making, is just severing the relationship with the land and severing the relationship with the culture and treating the tribes as if they are not sovereign nations, but they are a race of people to be assimilated into dominant US society. So that's the relocation component of the termination period. The next, um, and, and this is a contemporary picture, I use this because it's still the law of the land, was called Public Law 280. And this was passed in 1953. 
Um, and back step a little bit just to, to address sovereignty, which I know Courtney is going to get into as well. But sovereignty is the key legal concept that's protected in treaties, that a sovereign nation is able to make laws and um, uh, determine justice in its own land, right? And so there, for a long time in Indian country, there's kind of been a dual sovereigns um, because of the trust relationship that the federal government put on. So there was the federal government and there was the tribe. And those were both sovereigns who were in a trust relationship who were responsible for things like law enforcement and justice. Well, what Public Law 280 did was break down that relationship um, between the tribe and the federal government and give the states, which have often had very uneasy relationships with tribal nations within their borders, criminal and civil jurisdiction over Indian lands. So this meant that state police, state troopers then could go in and enforce laws on tribal lands. It also removed the ability of tribes to enforce laws against non-tribal members on their own lands. So it was a big blow to tribal sovereignty. And it only started in, let's see, I've got my list of states. It only started in Oregon, um, except on Warm Springs, which is an outlier in everything I'm telling you. Like everything I'm about to tell you happened to everyone one but Warm Springs. And I cannot figure out why. <laughs> There's like an absence of information why. Um, but everywhere else in Oregon, except Warm Springs, California, Nebraska, Minnesota, and Wisconsin, were the main states that this was focused on. Alaska was later added, and now several more states have been added. Um, now, both states and tribes have civil and criminal jurisdiction, and the federal government still does. And this makes legal matters really, really, really confusing in Indian country. Um, and the lawyer in me wants to talk more about that, but our focus is land. And so, we're going to move and talk mostly about tribal termination and what happened to both tribes and land there. But it's important to know that there was this entire package that was really about eroding sovereignty, eroding the land base and forcing assimilation. So tribal termination, this is really important for those of us in Oregon. There were 109 tribes that were officially terminated by the federal government. That meant their treaties were dissolved, the federal trust relationship was dissolved. They no longer had any identity as uh, tribal members or as indigenous people, anything other than US citizens. And um, of those 109 tribes, 61 of those were in Oregon, right? 61 were in Oregon and uh, 41 were in California. So the vast, vast majority of this impact was on the West Coast. So um, this, this quote really speaks to how devastating this um, practice is. And, and we're, gonna, we're gonna get into a little bit like what the law was that led to that. So in 1850, or not, sorry, not 1853, that was a hundred years back when they were making treaties. In 1953, um, termination kicked off with house, con concurrent resolution, oh, my, my phone is ringing, sorry. Um, tribal termination kicked off with House Resolution 108 in 1953. That announced the termination policy and called for the immediate ending of federal relationships with a selected group of tribes. Um, what they, they, they didn't terminate them all in one fell swoop. But between 1954 and 1964, Congress passed 14 acts that ended federal acknowledgement for those 109 tribes and bands. So like I said, most of those were in Oregon. Most of them were on the West Coast. The notable exception is the Menominee tribe in Wisconsin, um, which was another large tribe with a large land base and was specifically targeted for termination because of its land base. Um, but I want to focus mostly on what happened in Oregon, because that is the legacy that we are living right now. So we'll start with the Western Oregon Indian Termination Act of 1954, signed by President Eisenhower. 
And this was unique because of all of the termination acts, it affected the most tribes. So, and bans. We're gonna, we're gonna take a minute and just look at this list. Read the names, say them in your head. Wonder if you've heard them. Maybe you recognize a few because the list goes on. And it goes on. I want us to sit with that and just think about what a diverse place Oregon was when these tribes were here. With different languages, different cultures, different ways of being, different niches, different ways of working the land. And I feel emotional, like what's been lost? You know, it, it wasn't this act that lost most of it. Some of these tribes actually didn't have any enrolled members. They existed only on paper when they were terminated. But this is a list of all of the tribes that with one act of Congress ceased to exist to the federal government. So, yeah, that was a big, that was a big deal. And I'm here, I'll stay here for a sec. Um, so that, you know, as you saw, that included many of the tribes that we know now, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde, Silets, the Coos, the, the Coquille. Some of these have been re-recognized and we'll, we'll, we'll get there, but, um, I was just, I just want to sit with this. When I started reading this, it really, it just hit me. I've, I've thought a lot about termination in theory, but a lot of these tribes also had land. They had reservations that they'd gotten in treaties. Not, most of them weren't their homelands because people had been moved away from them, but all that land then got grabbed up by the federal government. And some of it got put into you know, public trust was managed by the Bureau of Land Management or the Forest Service. A lot of it got sold out again to private landowners. And um, people definitely got compensation for this, but it was not much. You know, for the Silets, is one of the, the numbers that I could find was how much they got. And for the Silets Reservation in the Central Coast Range, after it got valued, and divvied up each tribal member received $792.50. And remember before this, they were living free on their land. And now they had $792 and no land. And were expected to go out and make their way in the world with that. Remember that relo relocation program, right? Taking someone's land away is a great way to ensure that they relocate and giving them no economic base to move from. So this was yet another land theft and it took about 2 million acres back out of tribal hands. Um, just a little bit less than were recovered under the IRA. But you might be wondering, you know, be like, Brenna, on your list, aside from Warm Springs, which isn't there for who knows why Warm Springs got out of all this, the main one that's missing from my list is the Klamath tribe. And um, I want to do a deep dive into the Klamath tribe. But first, I, I want to take a little step back. I, I forgot to tell you that I've, in my research, I found three main reasons that people say that uh, the tribal termination policy really sprung up at this time in the 1950s. Um, one of the things about doing internet research is there's a lot of different theories and one surprised me. I don't know how true it is, but I wanted to include it because I thought it was interesting. Um, this happened at the same time as the Red Scare. And there is a theory that because tribes were communally holding land and thriving in their communal use of resources, um, and because the Indian Reorganization Act 
supported that, that it looked like the US government was supporting communism. And the most important thing to do was, you know, break up that and shift things to more private ownership. So that was one theory about one of the political forces behind termination. Um, the other two theories were, I, I could find much more uh, um, supported. One was the push for assimilation, you know, by dissolving that uh, idea of being a sovereign nation and a sovereign people and just shifting being Indian to a racial identity that didn't have any more rights and responsibilities than any other racial identity in relationship with the United States government. And the third, of course, was another land grab. So timber, water rights, oil, and other natural resources were at stake on Indian reservations. And treaties would become meaningless with the removal of the trust status, which is exactly what happened. So in essence, that revocation of the federal government's responsibility to protect Indian rights and treat under treaty agreements made the Indian property holders totally vulnerable to opportunists. So it was yet another land grab. So by 1960, at the end of the termination era, like I said, another 2 million acres had passed out of tribal hands. And nowhere was this more stark than what happened with the Klamath tribe. Theirs was the single largest loss of land in the entire termination era. The Klamath lost their entire 860, almost their entire 862,000 acre reservation. So many of you are familiar with this area down in kind of Southern Central Oregon. That's the boundary of their former reservation. The Klamath were one of the tribes that were specifically targeted because of their rich timberlands. The tribal trust property for the Klamath people totaled 590,000 acres and had the potential of producing about 3.8 billion board feet of lumber. And the Klamath were logging their land and they were supporting their people in large part by doing so. They also had water resources, including the headwaters of the Klamath River, um, which were also very attractive to outside interests. They were also targeted because Congress had received information um, from BIA officials and from some Indian political activists who promoted individual wealth, that the Klamath people were already virtually assimilated and were therefore ideal candidates from withdrawal from federal protection. Now, um, I read maybe too much about this. There's a lot of there's a lot of research about what happened with the Klamath tribe. And one of the things I learned is that there was a lot of tension within the tribe about the right way to go. And there were definitely members, like I said, who promoted this idea of ending the trust relationship and breaking up the tribal resources into individual holdings um, and thought that promoting individual wealth would be better for the tribe. There were many others who thought that holding on to the collective resource and managing it cooperatively um, were the way to go. And there was a lot of strife. However, as the termination got closer and closer, and um, as things moved towards it, there there became a I don't want to say a truce, or maybe just it was it was clear that there was a greater common enemy, which was that Congress didn't have the tribe's best interest at heart and just wanted the land. And those factions came together in the end to really strongly oppose termination. There were also voices of caution and dissent in the federal government. Um, in the 1856, there was a senior management specialist who told the Secretary of Interior that they were very mistaken about the Klamath's uh, readiness and especially economic readiness to be withdrawn from federal trust pr protection and concluded that economic disaster would befall the tribes and the Klamath Basin if large amounts of Klamath timber were sold basically sold to pay off withdrawing members because it would flood the timber market and there would be no more timber and their economy would crash, which it did. However, all despite all that, whoops, sorry. Um, here's a meeting of a, a federal hearing that was held with the Klamath people and Congress decided to pass public law 587 calling for 
quote, the termination of federal supervision over the property of the Klamath tribe of Indians located in the state of Oregon. And this affected the Klamath and Modoc tribes and the Yushuskin band of snake Indians. So it defined the tribal property as real or personal property, plus the water rights. So they lost their land, but they kept the water rights, which has created a very complex interweave of things that um, I'll, I'll, I'll get to in a moment. So the land whew, was gone. Um, however, they did say that the Klamath people, A, would be compensated uh, for the land. And it was to the tune of $43,000 per tribal member. And B, they also said that they would only move forward with this if the Klamath General Council approved the termination plan. So there's this opportunity, right, for the council, which was almost unanimously opposed to the plan to be able to stop it. However, there was this guy, Senator Arthur Watkins of Utah, who was one of the biggest proponents of termination, who was like, not so fast. <laughs> they, the Klamath had recently gotten a, one of those um, claims, the, the money claims back from the, the Claims Act for $2.6 billion. And Senator Watkins said, hey, Klamath tribe, you know that money that we're holding in trust for you? You only get it if you agree to termination. And so they did. It was a massively coerced decision. So as part of the termination settlement, each member of the Klamath tribe who acknowledged termination and left the reservation received $43,500 from the government. Those few who chose to stay in the tribe were left with a small amount of land to share, which was held in trust and managed by the US National Bank of Portland. Because remember, the tribe no longer had a relationship with the federal government. The vast majority of land that they held was either sold out to private timber interests or turned into the Fremont Wainema National Forest by John F. Kennedy in 1961. And I just wanted to have this, this doesn't talk about land so much as the social impact of termination on the Klamath tribe, which in the 1950s had been one of the wealthiest tribes in the country. And by the 1970s had two thirds of its members living in poverty. So there was a massive impact from losing the land base and losing the cultural cohesion that that land base allowed. And that is a huge legacy of termination. And on the Klamath tribe, it just happened on a scale that um, was much, much bigger than many of the others. Um, and I just want to touch briefly also on that water rights issue. It's going gonna, it's gonna to weave back into our land back discussion at the end as well, because it is very alive still right now to today, um, May 26th the AP came out with this article that the water crisis couldn't be worse on the Oregon California border that for the first time in 114 years they're not releasing water from the dams to the irrigators to the wildlife refuge or to the salmon and the Klamath tribe this is a picture from last week where the Klamath tribe for the first time since 2001 uh, got very vocal about water rights um, and they did a caravan through Klamath Falls asserting their water rights, which they have um, still and uh, the farmers want. And it's complex. I cannot, um, I cannot speak in, with any authoritative <laughs> voice about the Klamath Basin water crisis. Just know that it is still very alive. And as the drought continues, um, and you know the important, the, like the critical food, first foods that are in Klamath Lake continue to be critically endangered. The Klamath are going to be, they're saying, fighting harder and harder to keep water for their fish. Okay, now we're about to shift gears just a little bit and go to restoration. You know, termination was supposed to be forever. The tribes were just done, they were gone, the federal government, it's the final solution and they didn't have to engage with them anymore. Not so fast, said the tribes. They did not like the impacts of termination. 
And um, Courtney's actually going to cover a lot of the amazing civil rights organizing that tribes were doing during this time that pushed to the change in policy that began the process of tribal restoration. And nearly 20 years after the first termination legislation, the process really started to reverse, led in large part by the Menominee. Um, Menominee leader Ada Deer created helped create an organization called the Determination of Rights and Unity for Menominee shareholders. And they lobbied Congress hard for restoration of their sovereignty and had some degree of success in court also, asserting that they still had the right to hunt, gather, and fish on their native lands. That was a Supreme Court case in 1968. In 1970, President Richard Nixon gave a speech acknowledging that tribal termination was wrong. In 1973, he signed the first Restoration Act, which was the Menominee Restoration Act. And on January 4th, 1975, just two days before I was born, the federal termination policy officially ended. So you can look at me <laughs> and think, you know, that many years ago, uh, termination was still the thing. It's only been this 46 year period that restoration has been on the books. Um, so this is a very like modern era thing that we're, we're talking about. So there was a big shift then in the 70s. In 1977, 28 bills were introduced into Congress to restore tribe with more to come. And then in 1978, the federal government created a, an official recognition procedure for tribes. Here in Oregon, again, where tribes had been at hardest of anywhere in the country, in, 1990, in 1975 and 76, there were hearings in Salem. This is a picture of the hearing to restore the Grand Ronde tribe. Um, one thing that I found really challenging about this is that most of these tribes were terminated with one legislation, but every single tribe had to fight for its restoration. Each restoration was a separate act of Congress. And many of them had to do two acts, where in one act they regained federal recognition, and then in another act they regained their land, if, if regained at all. So from 1980, well, start, starting in 1977, with the Silets tribe getting recognized and restored, getting reservation land in 80, through Janu June 1989, when the Coquille were restored. That was the period of time in Oregon where the tribes were getting their status restored. However, it's not, like I said, it's not that whole list. We now have a lot of confederated tribes where bands, um, sometimes very diverse bands with different cultures and different languages are all now in the confederated tribes of Silets, confederated tribes of Grand Ronde, Coquille, the Coos, the Lower Umpqua, Sayusla as a confederated band. Um, so we've lost a lot of that, that diversity, but they do have tribal recognition and in some cases, some degree of land back. But it was hard <laughs> and exhausting for the tribes. Um, but, you know, now we're going to do a little transition. You know, we started way back in the beginning in the 1840s talking about treaties that took most of the land then moved to the 1870s where allotment took most of the land, and then 1950s where termination took any more land. Now we've done restoration. Um, that's not the whole restoration story. There are definitely tribes who are still fighting for restoration or even federal recognition. Like there's four bands of the Chinook Nation who do not have federal recognition. There are the ones at the mouth of the Columbia and they've been fighting for federal recognition for generations. Um, so the fights in, are in no way over, but I want to pivot a little bit and talk about in the movement of land back um, and kind of pre-land back, what, what that looks like. And so we're going to go back to the Klamath tribe and their fight to get some of the reservation land back. So here is a map. I couldn't find, I was surprised, I couldn't find any map that directly overlaid the reservation onto the free, existing Fremont Wayneman National Forest. So I, I drew the best, <laughs> the best polygon that I could. Um, so that's 
essentially what the Klamath Reservation was. And you can see how it's a mishmash of private lands, which are the gray. Um, many of them are large uh, in like private corporation timber holdings. And then the Fremont and Wainema National Forest. So in 2001, the Klamath tribe went through a big water battle with farmers over the right to maintain in-stream flows for their native fish. And they worked hard with a lot of allies, including many conservation groups to gain those rights. And then in 2003, the George W. Bush administration said, hey, Klamath tribes, you really want your land back. Okay, we'll give you your land back. However, you have to give us your water rights so that the farmers can have first dibs on the water for irrigation, right? Which is an impossible conundrum because if the Klamath gave up their water rights, both the, their important first foods and culturally significant two types of sucker fish who are only in Klamath Lake, who are severely endangered would have a hard time, but then also all the tribes downstream on the Klamath, like the Yurok and the Hoopa who rely on the salmon would also not have water, right? So giving away their water rights basically would screw them and downstream people and the fish and the wildlife refuge. However, they wanted their land back. That's a lot of land to have, right? And again, it was this kind of like this creation of the federal government to take people who had, were allies both in the tribes and between the tribes and the conservation groups and create wedges in those relationships because it, you know, kind of put the land versus water in fights with each other. So again, I don't know all the ins and outs of this. I know it was highly complex and highly fraught. And I first heard of it when I was living in Southern Oregon, working for Klamath Siskiyou Wildland Center. Um, and I heard about it in large part because Oregon Wilds, who is an, you know, a group that, that we're allied with and work with a lot, came out pretty hard against the Klamath land return. And I didn't understand why um, and, and was upset about that. Um, and in some, you know, in, in a way in getting, getting ready for this, I was like, I have, to, I have to talk to the people at Oregon Wild and, and figure that out because one of the main things we're trying to do with this webinar series is build solidarity with um, native tribes and build solidarity with the land back movement. Like understanding how they lost their land and why helps me to really understand why it's so important to transfer the land. So I recently talked to the ED of uh, Oregon Wild, Sean Stevens, and then Steve Pettery, who wasn't, neither of whom were part of that original opposition to the Klamath land return. And I asked them, I said, well, what's going on there? Because, you know, it seems like it's more complicated. I just heard you were opposed to land back. They're like, no, it's, it's more complicated than that. Um, and they explained about the water issue. And they explained about that, that challenging context and why they came the way they did it. Um, and, and it was interesting, you know, I also, they, they sent a letter to the Klamath tribe in 2015 that explained more of their position because the tribe tried again in 2015. And I just wanted to read you a, a brief excerpt from the letter so I can use their own words to explain it. And said, quote, Oregon Wild recognizes the ugly history of federal policy of tribal termination and the role it played in the establishment of some portions of Fremont Wainema National Forest and the Klamath Marsh National Wildlife Refuge. However, we believe that the removal of some or all of the national forest from America's public land system would create unnecessary and unproductive conflict. There are better and more attainable ways for the Klamath tribes to achieve a land base, environmental restoration, and economic self-sufficiency from Oregon Wild to the Klamath tribe. I understand that things were complex around the water rights, and I understand the, also the complexity around um, basically giving up control of federal lands, which I think is true for a lot of environmental groups. We feel like if there was native sovereignty over the land and they were allowed to do with it as they felt pleased, maybe our values wouldn't be represented. I get that like in my body as a conservationist. 
But there's also something that's off for me um, in this. And I think as I did a little bit more research, um, I unearthed something that, that made sense to me. I think there's this historic bias in, towards public land return that runs deep in the DNA of groups like Bark and Oregon Wilds. And um, I found it summed up in a quote by Andy Kerr, who worked for Oregon Wild for two decades and now does a lot of his own policy work and writing. And um, he deeply objects to public lands becoming tribal lands. And of the Western Oregon Tribal Fairness Act, um, which returned ancestral homelands to the Coos, uh, Lower Umpqua, Sayusla, and Cow Creek tribes, he recently wrote, quote, the Democrats who support this legislation came down on the side of Native Americans and in this case, against nature. He also said, the currency of compensation by the United States to Native American tribes ought to be the currency of dollars, not that of the irreplaceable and precious public lands that belong to all of us. And that quote, which could have been you know, the first bit totally pulled out of the Indian Claims Act, right? We're just going to give you money, not land. And that idea that this precious and irreplaceable land is somehow more valuable to the generic American public than to the indigenous people who have lived there from time immemorial. Those are the ghosts of settler coloni colonialism in the conservation movement that this entire webinar series is trying to exorcise. Right, like that's what I need to undo in myself. That's what I need to do undo in bark. That's what I want to undo in the whole movement is realize that indigenous people's relationship with land is truly different. And I might really enjoy a place as a hiker. I might've been going there my whole life. My grandparents might've been going there. I have places like that in the Clackamas, but it's just nothing, nothing like having a 10,000 year history with a place that's been ruptured and um, broken over and over and over again by an oppressive force <laughs> of the US government and of the colonists. And, and I feel like, you know, it's heavy, but like I want us to recognize that this isn't just generic land that belongs to all of us. When we're looking at that polygon, that is the land of the Klamath people and it deserves to be back with them with their water rights intact, <laughs> you know, because I think having that zero sum game will just continue to create this unnecessary conflict. Um, I do want to finish by by talking a little bit about that Western Oregon Tribal Fairness Act. And to be fair, Oregon Wild was very active participants in moving that forward. Um, I think they have grown and changed as an organization and are working to exorcise those ghosts. Um, that passed the federal uh, Congress in, and was signed by Donald Trump in 2019, and it transferred 1,700 acres of BLM managed land to the Cow Creek Band of Umpqua. Um, so nothing near what their tribal land was, but they got 17,000 acres. So they now has a reservation for the first time since termination. And then 1,500 acres to the Coos, Lower Umpqua, and Sayusla tribes. And in that process, there was deep engagement between conservation groups and the tribes. People really hold that as an example of what it might look like to move forward to do land return. Again, the numbers are small, right? That's 15,000 and 17,000 acres. That's not the 700,000 acre Klamath reservation, um, but it's also something. And it's also because there has been just amazing work on behalf of native tribes to pound the drum for getting their land back. I mean, this isn't because of the largesse of the hearts of, of any of the conservation groups or the politicians. This comes because people would not stop fighting for their land back. And there is a great Mother Jones article about this. I cannot put in, um, I don't know how to put in links while I'm talking, but while Courtney's talking, I'm gonna put in a lot of links to the articles that I used to research this. And I wanna end with the Klamath tribe because they might not have the forest back, but they just this year um, made what they consider uh, 
monumental and historic land acquisition transition, which doubles their current holdings of land by purchasing the 1700 acre Rocky Ford Ranch. And I'm gonna read you the quote from their tribal um, news release about acquiring this land earlier this year. Quote, for now, this piece of former reservation can considered, be considered officially returned, creating a special moment in our tribe's history. And that is something that all tribal members can celebrate with pride and resuscitate the cultural and spiritual healing process. So here's to that just being the first of many, many, many returns of both private land and public land as we all move together to do our best to try and right this massive historical wrong of the land theft that the indigenous people of this continent have gone through. So with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Courtney. Thanks, we'll have time hopefully for some questions and conversation at the end. So I am largely kind of going to go back over the same time frame that Brenna did and then in, in, come closer to our into our modern moment. Um, but to give a little more space specifically to what Native people said about all of these developments uh, that the US government was putting forward. To start with, um, I wanted to bring up the Indian Citizen Act, Citizenship Act of 1924. And although a lot of white groups, or I should say some white groups, were supportive of Indian citizenship, uh, Native folks themselves were really mixed about that. And some who supported it considered citizenship as a way to secure long-term uh, political identity in this, this country. But those who rejected it were really worried about losing their tribal sovereignty um, and their tribal citizenship and how that would conflict. And obviously, lots of folks were reluctant uh, to trust the government that had been so nefarious and violent toward them for hundreds of years. But state and federal governments were really unified in saying, let's make Native people citizens and just treat them like we would treat anyone else. We don't have to do all these special, special efforts. Um, one group who really opposed um, making Native people U.S. citizens was the Onondaga Nation. And, what is now New York State, largely in Pennsylvania, I think. Um, they considered that to be treason, to change your citizenship in that way. Um, and they believed that the Senate was forcing citizenship without the consent of Native people. Um, they specifically cited that citizenship would further disregard treaties that had been made, specifically the 1784 Treaty of Fort Stanwix and the 17. 89 Treaty of Fort Harmer, you can write these down if you want, and the 1794 Treaty of the Canandaigua, in which the Iroquois were recognized as separate and sovereign. And so if you absorb people into citizenship, is that like a sneaky way of canceling their sovereignty? I think it's a fair argument. Um, so the bill did pass with little lobbying from Native folks. It was primarily two white groups, um, progressive, people at the time who were like friends of Indians and uh, supported that because it would involve this guardianship status as, uh, as they would become citizens. Then again, thanks Bernie, you can move to the next one. The Indian Reorganization Act. Um, a lot of people consider this to be as bad as part of the, you know, things like um, boarding schools and of these other policies of assimilation. Um, and as Brenna already described, this offered federal subsidies to tribes as long as they would adopt constitutions that were similar to the Constitution of the United States and replace their traditional governments with a city council style government. And there are transcripts from the hearings on that act from back in the day that uh, many traditional Native elders were really concerned about um, accepting the Indian Reorganization Act. In Vine Deloria and Clifford Little's book, American Indians, American Justice, uh, published in 1983, they wrote, the new constitutions called for the election of council members and were based on the old boss farmer districts, which had been drawn when the allotment policy dictated that the Indians would be taught to farm. Familiar cultural groupings and methods of choosing leadership gave way to more abstract principles of American democracy, 
which viewed people as interchangeable and communities as geographical marks on a map. Although there were some variations, in general, the new tribal constitutions and bylaws were standardized and largely followed the Anglo-American system of organizing people. As you can see in this picture, the Secretary of the Interior is handing uh, the delegates from the Flathead Reservation, so the Salish and Kootenai, and maybe some others that I am not familiar with, handing them their constitution for them to accept. And by doing so, they accept the tenets of the IRA and some of the subsidies and resources that came along with that. So out of the 200 and, or there are 260 some tribes who did accept the standardized constitutions handed down to them. And then there were 77 tribes who did not. Um, I think that there's an argument here. I know there is that uh, even accepting, you know, as if the US federal government was the one to introduce the idea that a tribe can and should govern itself. Obviously, Native nations had already already and always had the right to self-governance and had already been uh, organizing their own governmental structures. And this this act of Congress did not in any way like grant them that. It's a really big and a big assumption. Um, and I'm forgetting, I'm like losing the, the word that I wanted to throw out there, uh, but maybe it'll come to me later. So, um, the IRA and the Indian Reorganization Act spurred, you can move to the slide, the following slide, the Congress of National Congress of American Indians in 1944 to try and enhance their treaty and sovereignty rights um, after they had been kind of many tribes had been weakened by Indian reorganization. This is uh, the mission. Oh, the mission was to protect and enhance treaty rights, to secure traditional laws and cultures and ways of life in the face of these assimilationist policies, um, and to promote common understanding of the rightful place of tribes in the family of American governments. And I think it, as a pushback against this um, assimilative forms of government that the IRA put upon them. And it, turning into the civil rights era, in 1957, this should be a story that's familiar to folks in Oregon. Um, the year after the Indian Relocation Act was passed, um, that was encouraging Native people to leave the treaty lands and go live in the cities and take up the jobs that the act through the, uh, the adults, I forget what the language they used was, um, job training programs. The year after that, they inundated Celilo Falls with the Dells Dam. And when they did that on the um, what is so-called the Columbia River, it, it drowned a 10,000-year-old village. Um, and that was part of the nation's effort to harness electrical power. So that raises yet another question in our modern time. Um, is it not um, an injustice? Maybe it should even be considered a human rights violation to destroy a Native people's way of life in order to produce energy that feeds, you know, the settler, colonial, the Western capitalist way of life. Um, and hopefully in another workshop, we can properly critique things like um, dams for, for electrical clean energy. So the red power movement um, is an analog to the black power movement of the civil rights era. era. And um, communities and activists that were organizing for sovereignty and greater recognition of the um, mistreatment of Native communities were really using confrontational tactics. Uh, we can go to the next slide. There's a couple of books there for your reading list. Uh, the Fish Wars here in our region, actually just you know the Washington and Oregon region, were um, a series of civil disobedience protests and these all concerned treaty rights that were reserved for Native people to hunt and fish in their usual and accustomed places, as most treaties included that specific language, so that uh, tribal members would be able to, in perpetuity, access places uh, for fishing and hunting that were outside of the reservation boundaries. Um, but as soon as white settlers established a commercial canning industry, the salmon runs began to collapse. And that ha happened as early as 1880. 
And so they started to, the states, Washington state in this case, started to really vigilantly enforce restrictions on native fishermen at the same time that there was rapid growth of the white commercial and sport fisheries. And they really emphasized that the reason they were, they were restraining native fishermen was um, a progressive conservation policy. And the courts had also granted the states the right to regulate fishing, but native people had um, challenged this and that their fishing rights had been uh, insured in treaties and the state could not usurp their treaty rights. And this, the Supreme Court had actually supported that and overturned some rulings against the Yakima when they, the state tried to convict a Yakima fisherman of um, violating the regulations. But mostly the game wardens of the state would have just ignored that the, that the Supreme Court had had affirmed that, and that was leading to some really dramatic um, altercations in the area. And by the 1940s, a man named Billy Frank Jr., who was a young man at the time, um, and his community in, the, in their custom fishing places were really being like staked out by game wardens who were looking to arrest native people for fishing. And so the more pressure that the state put on the people, the more um, organized the people became, and they started sitting, doing fish ins, similar to a sit in. And that all led up to, in 1970, um, the, a battle, what they call a battle on the Puyallup, Puyallup River in Washington, where about 200 Native folks and some white supporters have, had established a camp. And they kept getting raided by game wardens. Um, they were raided by hundreds of cops in riot gear. And those images were broadcast nationally, uh, which really started to drive this conversation to the congressional level. And so the Justice Department filed a lawsuit against the state of Washington, and the judge assigned to that was named Justice Bolt. So you'll see the Bolt decision um, is something that really helps to cement treaty rights over state rights, especially when it comes to the interpretation of how much uh, access non-treaty folks have to um, or not, sorry, non-Native folks have to resources like fish. In the Bolt decision, he declared that Native people should have 50% of the catch. That was his interpretation of the treaty. And that made a lot of sport fishermen upset. Um, he was threatened. Um, Native fisher people were threatened. And it was a big, a big showdown at the time. And next slide. Hopefully they're in order. Yes, <laughs> Billy Frank Jr. is gonna be honored soon having a statue um, that will replace this missionary pioneer guy, Mark, Marcus Whitman at the, at the National Capitol. So in, the, in this time that we're in of removing Confederate monuments and things like that, we see also a recognition of this, this history. Next slide, please, Brenna. Okay. Now there's like, I'm going to talk about a series of direct actions that happened across the country um, that really influenced the presidential perspective on um, the relationship between the United States and tribes. The one which hopefully many people have heard about is the occupation of Alcatraz. And this was by a group called Indians of All Tribes um, based out of San Francisco. They occupied the island for 19 months. Um, they declared it Indian land. They had a list of demands here, which they based kind of um, humorously, ironically, on um, their interpretation of what the white man believed was a good place for Indians, which would be the reservations and places that, such as not having modern facilities, not having fresh water, not having industry or in high unemployment, no educational facilities, um, and a population that has always been held as prisoners and kept dependent on others. And at, the, at this occupation, um, John Trudell was running radio, uh, oops, Radio Free Alcatraz from there. Um, John Trudell is a really powerful speaker, a writer, 
who was targeted by the FBI and CIA for his activism. And this action led to at least 75 more property reclamations over the next decade or so. Next slide, please. Folks have probably heard of the American Indian Movement. Um, some of the leaders, not, not nearly all the people involved, but some of the leaders who you might be able to find writings or speeches from online would be those listed there. Russell Means, Dennis Banks, Madonna Thunderhawk, Anime Akash, Clyde Bellancourt, Pat Bellinger, and Sarah Badharbel. They formed AIM in Minnesota as a direct, in Minneapolis, Minnesota, as a direct response to the Indian Relocation Act. So focusing on organizing the urban native community who is experiencing police brutality and poverty and redlining due to having been moved or coerced to move off their reservations and into cities. Next slide. In 1970, oh, Good, that video looks like it's gonna work. In 1970, another group called the United American Indians and then supported by AIM in 1971, held two occupations at Mount Rushmore. Uh, I can play the video. In 67, American Indians are using a well-known national landmark to carry their land claim protest to new heights. I tapas reports from the Black Hills of South Dakota. Another dawn rises over Mount Rushmore, over Washington and Roosevelt, Jefferson and Lincoln. But it also rises these days over a small band of American Indians who cling not only to the craggy edges of the mountain, but to the hope that someday this land will be theirs again. Three times each day, teams of young men and women make the 3,000 foot climb to the Indian camp to bring supplies to support their protest. These Indians have renamed Mount Rushmore. It is now called Crazy Horse Mountain. The Indians, about 30 of them, have been here since last weekend when, against federal regulations, they set up a camp on the mountainside close to the memorial. They claim these Black Hills of South Dakota are legally theirs by treaty, and they have come to take them back. To dramatize their protest, the Indians perch on a ledge overlooking the main pavilions and shout slogans to the tourists below. One of their leaders is Lehman Brightman, president of United Native Americans, an Indian protest group. Well, first I should say the federal government said this land would belong to us as long as the grass grows and the water flows and the sun shines. Then six years later they sent uh, General Custer into this area on an expedition and they discovered gold here in the Black Hills. Then they turned around and took this land from us. We're sick and tired of sitting back and uh, turning the other cheek and then bend over and get those other two kicked. You're going to see some wide awake educated Indians. We've got some new Indians coming up, new warriors. And we're, this is a breeding ground right here. You're going to see a lot of spark. The National Park Service at first offered some small resistance to the camping Indians, but now it is the intention of the rangers to cooperate with the protesters until someone in Washington figures out what to do with them. Wallace McCaw, president of the National Memorial. They say they have a right to the land. Yes, uh, and it's uh, never been finally determined uh, in the courts or by uh, the means that are open as to just who does own the land. It's still in litigation. Do you think maybe that's why you're letting them stay there? Uh, you know, there's a 50% chance they're right that it is theirs. Mm -hmm. That does give them possibly uh, a little bit more of a right than you and I might have. The Indians say they will stay until they get what they want, and what they want is to meet with Interior Secretary Walter Hickel to demand that the Black Hills be given back to them. But Hickel is out of the country and will not be back for at least five days. So it appears as if Washington, Jefferson, Roosevelt, and Lincoln will have to share their mountain with the Indians, at least until then. 
It appears as if the Indians, in their latest battle with the federal government, have won at least the first few rounds. Ike Pappas, CBS News, at Mount Rushmore, South Dakota. Vince Lombardi, the famed football... So, when the park officials asked them how long they were going to stay, their spokesperson, spokesperson said, as long as the grass grows, the water flows, and the sun shines, which was a reference to what um, President J Jackson, but back when he was General Jackson, promised to, the way he, he stated his promise to protect the life and land of Native people in Mississippi immediately before his massive Indian removal campaign, which we talked about in part one of the series. In 1980, the Supreme Court awarded the Sioux Nation $105 million as compensation for their loss of the Black Hills, but the Sioux Nation has rejected that and the tribes continue to demand they want the land and the money re re remains in some government bank account they haven't collected. Today, there is a modern uh, petition going to get, get the Black Hills restored to the Sioux Nation and you can support it on this link, which I'm gonna put in here, in the chat, right? There. Um, Brenna, you can go to the next slide. Another action um, of the Red Power Movement was called the Trail of Broken Treaties. This was a cross country action that began in Seattle and um, San Francisco with a caravan that convened in Milwaukee with the American Indian Movement where they drafted a 20 point position paper asserting the sovereignty of Indian nations. And then they headed in their caravan to DC to deliver it directly to President Nixon. I'm gonna drop a summary of the 20 point paper in the chat instead of reading all 20 points, but I will, I would do wanna highlight a couple of them. First of all, um, that the United States government should retract the component of the Indian Appropriations Act of 1971, which eliminated Indian nations to contract constitutionally bound treaties with the US government, so asserting sovereignty. And then there were uh, a pledge that they would meet with Indian representatives before the election, the upcoming election to discuss the future of Indian nations and they wanted national media present. So really visibilizing the legal complexity that Indian nations and Indian people have with the government and trying to bring that to the American public. Here's a full list of their 20 point, oops, hang on, maybe six at a time, uh, 20 point plan. Then you can go to the next slide, Bruno, uh, while I'm doing this. They drove to Washington, but when they arrived, um, they went to the Bureau of Indian Affairs office and they hadn't any, made any arrangements of where they would stay. And so they asked to be allowed to stay in the Bureau of Indian Affairs because they had an auditorium and they had um, a kitchen and things like that and they were denied. And so they weren't really getting an opportunity to meet with the president. And the president was like out of town that day as well. <laughs> which that's what happened when they wanted to talk to um, the Department of the Interior about Mount Rushmore. So I wonder if they were actually out of town. Um, but as they were waiting to see if they could have some arrangements made for their housing, the guards of the Bureau of Indian Affairs tried to kick them out. And so they like buckled down and started an occupation. And they stayed at in the BIA for six days um, and this was the week before the election, so it was hugely visible um, accidental action. They uh, put up like a teepee. They created banners on the outside of the building that said American India or Indian Embassy. Um, and they really captured the attention of the entire country. It also made the American Indian movement a target of the uh, COINTELPRO, which was a covert operation of the FBI was using against black activists at the time as well. Um, but by the end of the occupation, the Bureau of Indian Affairs had agreed to hire native people to work there on staff. Um, so they did manage to get some concessions. They also did manage to meet with the president who the next year, you can move to the next slide or soon in his, in his um, next administration, 
passed the Indian Self-Determination Education Assistance Act, which similarly to the Indian Citizenship Act, it was met with a lot of um, suspicion and um, opposition from more traditional Native people. Um, and recently, Dina um, Jaleo Whitaker has written that the problem with this, um, this version of self-determination is the context of this colonial relationship where self-determination is really reduced to like self-governance and the paternalistic relationship that's overarching still remains. Um, another academic, um, Sam Cook, who's at Virginia Tech has said, the plague of so-called self-determination from 1960 to the present has been the piecemeal approach that policymakers have exercised in formulating Indian policy. The executive branch, Congress and the courts perceive of and articulate different interpretations of self-determination at different times. So if a foreign government is really determining or interpreting what self-determination means for native nations, then it doesn't really seem like it's a true form of self-determination. And in fact, what this act actually did was give the government the ability to make direct contracts with tribes, just as it does with states, for the implementation of um, programs and distribution of resources. So another kind of like a return to some kind of treaty making. It's not in any way um, taking the government's hands out of the tribe's business though it is referred to as self-determination. And I threw those couple books there that I found really informative. So thought I'd pass them on to you. Um, the self-determination question is a big one um, and it's being debated even at the international level at the UN and places like that where in indigenous nations all around the world are looking to get really strong definitions of self-determination in international law and it doesn't exist yet which is not surprising because colonial governments are still more powerful even in um, the united nations setting uh, next slide Brenna. so to start to close us out i wanted to you know dig a little bit more into this concept of sovereignty and the fact that all Native nations do have that already, whether or not the US government, quote unquote, gives it to them or grants it to them. And you know their sovereignty is continuing to be infringed upon by colonial and imperialist foreign nations like the US. And so it really limits the way that they're able to um, like embody sovereignty when they're underneath the United States government. And land back really is a way, I think, to give sovereignty some teeth, because if you don't have land, as Brennan was describing, in those situations where tribes were terminated and they didn't have a land base, they also kind of they lost recognition legally and, and effectively um, from the other governments. And basically, if you don't have land to back up your your right to existence, then a colonial government is not gonna regard you as a real nation. So the modern um, iteration of this is hashtag land back. If you type hashtag land back into the internet, you will find all the things um, that you need to know. And that is on every level from individual landowners giving land back to federal agencies returning land, um, tribes and whether they've been recognized by the federal government in the past or not, are getting their land base, which means they're going to be able to establish their sovereignty in a stronger way. And it's happening all over the world, but I just have a few examples from what's now called the U.S. beyond the ones that Brenda's already mentioned, and a couple of ways that you can support um, the return of lands to Indigenous people. So for one, the um, Leech Lake Band of Ojibwe in Minnesota uh, had their bill signed to get the land returned to them in December, and Trump signed that bill. This uh, directs the Forest Service to transfer 11,760 acres of what is the Chippewa National Forest um, to the Department of Interior to be held in trust for the Leech Lake, Lake Band of Ojibwe as part of their reservation. And those lands were illegally transferred to the National Forest in the 1940s and 50s without proper consent 
of the tribe. Next slide. In California, in Ohlone, in Esalen, um, Amamutsun and Rumson territory, a Portland-based group called Western Rivers Conservancy helped to secure millions of dollars from California natural resources to buy land and then return it to the control of the Esalen tribe. It's 1,200 acres near Big Sur. Next slide. Um, back in Minnesota, the Lower Sioux Indian community is getting a small parcel. It's just a couple hundred acres back from the Minnesota Historical Society, so back from the state of Minnesota. Um, and it's actually a piece of land where the War of 1862 began and where the government, U.S. government, executed 38 Lakota Sioux men in the largest mass execution in the history of the country. Um, and that is very recent, just in the last month or two. So at every level of individual, state, and federal. Um, and one more slide. This one's interesting. The National Bison Range, which was created in the middle of the Flathead Reservation. So the government took away this land from the reservation in order to create the National Bison Range in the very same area that um, tribal leaders had already brought, they had, they had brought bison back on horseback, like led bison back across the mountains from where the community used to live before they removed to, removed to the reservation. And they had been um, recovering bison in this area for a couple of generations. And then I can't remember his name, um, a conservationist, wildlife guy, um, got, got it in his head that he wanted to create a national bison refuge, pitched it to Congress and got all the support, and then ended up um, having this section of land taken away from the Salish and Kootenai to have the bison refuge in the, I think, in the 40s and 50s. And they are just now being given back management of the bison refuge, although I think it still kind of remains a federal in holding in the middle of their, um, of their reservation. So they're getting 18,000 acres that already was theirs back again. And they're getting the management of the bison, which they had been managing before in the first place. Okay, last slide. So there's some things going on right now that people may know about or may support. There's um, line three, which um, there's and there's many petitions going on all over the internet that you can find asking Biden in particular, but there's a few other targets. There's Oak Flat, which is in Arizona, um, which is gonna be developed for mining unless the government intervenes and gives the tribes their um, spiritual practices maintains their rights to their spiritual practices. There's another one that just got dropped in the chat. So yeah, I would love to hear or see more. What, what, what are people following? How are they, um, how are you all looking for opportunities to support what's going on right now where there are native movements that are continuing in this history that we've been discussing? I see Land on the Oregon coast for Clatsa, giving them access back to the ocean. Does anyone else have any other land back campaigns that they're aware of? Paying real rent. There's a couple of, I've seen Duwamish, which is up near Seattle, and also some tribes in the San Francisco area looking for real rent or real taxes <clears throat> where you voluntarily donate to the tribes that whose land you're on. Here are a couple of links to some land trusts, native led land trusts, Black Mesa. So we hope that this kind of in-depth look at law and policy paired with um, a telling of the the impact on Native people and their response has given you all some new ideas about uh, 
what the conservation movement um, in public lands and, and national forests as part of the public land system um, need to do to kind of get right with get right with the world. Yeah, I want to have a big thanks to Courtney. This was her brainchild, um, and it's been so fantastic to do this work, um, to branch out as an organization and to challenge other organizations like us to look at the conservation movement um, really critically, with love, but critically, and think about how we need to change ourselves and our work and our organizations to um really start moving more towards indigenous land justice, which is a massive component of environmental justice and one that has been missing from the dialogue and conservation groups for a very long time. So it's really exciting to be pushing this work forward. And I'm grateful for all of you to come and give us the time and attention. And I hope that you now take this and have conversations with people. I love hearing what you said, Katya, about how you're using this. I know, um, like the entire staff of Cascadia Wildlands, kind of a sister organization of ours in Eugene, has watched each segment and they're bringing it into their EDI work. And we hope that these discussions are ongoing. This is not just a point in time. This is how we change everything. Um, now that we know how it got to be this way, to some degree, we know how to dismantle it, which is kind of exciting. <laughs>